And welcome everyone. I'm Rabbi Joseph Mesler at Temple Sinai. I am delighted to be able to welcome you to this panel discussion, celebrating the book, Light Beyond the Shadows, the legacy of the Czech Torah scrolls and the renewal of Jewish life in Chechia. And here's a copy of the book. To start us off, I'm going to take us back in time in the life of our congregation of Temple Sinai in Sharon, Massachusetts, when we restored our Czech Memorial Torah scroll. And Rabbi Kevin Hale is on the call and he was our sofa, he was our scribe. And we had a year long celebration of uh, restoring the scroll and making it kosher and then bringing it back to use. So I'm going to share a video from that time as people join us. Enjoy.
Welcome, everybody, and I hope some of you who are members of Temple Sinai and were there for the restoration of our scroll and all of those events and that reunion of the scrolls brings back that memory. What a great way to celebrate uh, Jewish life. And so I am so delighted, and I have to say I flipped through the pictures of you while that was playing, and Rabbi Hale, I saw you there, and you were grinning ear to ear as you were watching that video. So let me take a moment now just to introduce our panelists and the subject of our talk today. First of all, we are celebrating the Czech Torah scroll story. And for those of you who may not be familiar, in 1942, in the midst of the Shoah of the Holocaust, a letter was sent from the Central Jewish Museum in Prague telling every community in Bohemia and Moravia to send their Jewish items there. The purpose of that letter is a mystery. The idea that this was for the Nazis to create a museum of an extinct race is now considered a myth but it might have been to try to rescue these items. The items included over 1800 Torah scrolls. By the end of the Shoah, the Nazis succeeded in murdering 80,000 of the 87,000 Czech Jews. Then in 1948, a communist takeover shut down any access to Czech Jewish life. Then finally, in 1964, negotiations enabled the Torah scrolls to be sent from Prague to the Westminster Synagogue in London. And of these scrolls, the Memorial Scrolls Trust has lent out 1,564 scrolls around the world. One of those scrolls is on loan to Temple Sinai in Sharon, and that's what we were seeing was being restored. So who are our panelists? First, we have Lois Roman, who is a trustee of the Memorial Scrolls Trust and serves as a U.S. representative based on the East Coast. Lois began her involvement with MST, with the Memorial Scrolls Trust, several years ago, following a long career on Wall Street as a money manager. We also have Julius Mueller, co-author of the book, a former geneticist. He is a freelance genealogist and director of Mueller and Honig. Julius lectures and publishes on Jewish family history topics and is a contributing editor to Avotenu. He is a former chairman of the progressive Jewish community Beit Simcha in Prague. He is also director of Toldot, Jewish Family History Center in Prague. Its mission 
is to collect and inventory the records of Jewish interest in the archives of the Czech Republic, as well as digitize the records for online studies. And finally, Sheila Pellet is the co-author and photographer of the book, Light Beyond the Shadows. She is, of course, most famously a member of Temple Sinai. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of seeing her uh, as not only a member, but as a mom and as a grandma uh, here at our temple. And I will also tell you that she uh, studied and became an adult bat mitzvah at our synagogue. And I will never forget the first time that she learned to read Hebrew and she chanted the Hebrew blessings uh, for the Torah entirely in Hebrew by herself. And she let out this ecstatic scream of pure joy from the bima when she realized that she could do that. And as you can see from the book, she is an extraordinarily talented photographer, but more importantly is her dedication to this project and the spirit of Judaism that led her on this transformative journey. So I wanna welcome all of our panelists. And our first thing that we are going to do uh, is we're gonna turn it over to Lois uh, and Lois, if you could please unmute yourself as she's going to be our first presenter. And if you have any questions, please use the chat function. That's how we're going to be able to manage this wonderfully large crowd that is online with us. I have one more welcome, which is to Ambassador Daniel and Jill Marin, who is the Israeli ambassador to the Czech Republic is also on our call. And I wanna say what a big and wonderful welcome to have you be able to join us for this celebration of life. Great, so uh, thank you very much, Rabbi. And uh, thank you to everybody on the call for inviting me to participate in this really wonderful project. Before I begin, um, I'd like to just say on behalf of the Memorial Scrolls Trust, we are so incredibly grateful to Sheila and Julius for opening up a beautiful new lens through which we can view our scroll collection and also so the world can view the Czech Jewish communities that perished in the Shoah. So Rabbi, if you will be my administrator, yes, thank you very much. Today, I'm going to briefly explain how it came to be that 1,564 scrolls in the MST collection managed to survive the Holocaust and end up all around the world. It's simply a story of miracles, of being hidden in plain sight, and of so many people just doing the right thing. So next slide, please. I'd like to frame the story with four miracles. So let's start with miracle number one. There were a thousand years of Jewish history in the Czech lands before World War II. There was even a Jewish museum in Prague that was started in 1906. When by the time the Nazis invaded in 1939, Judaica was at risk of being destroyed. As you can see in this photo, these are Torah scrolls. They're ripped, they're on the floor, they're in a shambles. It was announced, as the rabbi mentioned, that all Judaica from Bohemia and Moravia was to be sent to Prague for collection. And we're lucky enough to have had the, cura one, the curators of the Jewish Museum of Prague offering their assistance to meticulously catalog each and every item, including the Torah scrolls. They stocked them by type and they put them in buildings in Prague for safekeeping. Eventually, even those museum curators were sent off to Terezin. But importantly, the scrolls were not destroyed, as you see in this picture. Instead, they were hidden in plain sight. If we could have the next slide. Miracle number two. The scrolls remained in Prague in that warehouse through the end of the war. And many of you might not realize that Prague was not bombed during the war. And most of the buildings were intact. You can see here a photo of the Jewish town hall. I love this photo because you can see the clock with the Hebrew symbols on it. The Czech Jewish community was devastated by the Shoah and only a few thousand Jews returned. One very important survivor, 
was one of those museum curators. When the communists came in in 1948, the Jews that had returned to the Czech lands realized that their Judaica and their Judaism was at risk. So the curator approached the communist government and offered to clear away some of that warehouse space in Prague. And she and other Jews moved the Torah collection from the center of Prague to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of Prague for safekeeping. Now we move to miracle number three. The scrolls stayed in that warehouse from 1948 until the 1960s. And in the early 1960s, British art dealer Eric Esterich was hunting for treasures in Prague to bring back to the West to sell when he was approached by a communist government official who tapped him on the shoulder and offered to sell him some Judaica. Well, Esterich reached out to Ralph Yablon, a member of this synagogue, the Westminster Synagogue in London. He was a founding member of the synagogue and he purchased the entire contents of the Mishli synagogue. That entire contents, the entire collection of MST was sent to the shul in 1964. Next slide, please. Miracle number four. The Scrolls Trust was established to oversee the maintenance of not just the scrolls physically, but also their story. A sofer named David Brand worked for 30 years at the trust, restoring the scrolls and keeping them, uh, maintaining them and trying to improve them at least so that they could be sent out to congregations around the world. As soon as they were ready, letters poured into the trust from congregations everywhere, all kinds of congregations, reform, conservative, orthodox, museums, libraries, everyone wanted one of these scrolls to remember the Holocaust. Today, we have 1400 scrolls around the world. They've been lent on permanent loan and they are in such far flung places. They're in Australia, South Africa, South America, many countries in Europe, of course, Israel. And lastly, we have 1000 scrolls here in the US from states from Maine to Florida to Alaska and Hawaii. If you could put up the next slide, thank you. The MST collection consists of 1,564 scrolls, 400 Torah binders or wimples, and a few extremely unusual at time. We certainly hope that once the pandemic is finished and you're traveling through London, you'll come see our museum, which is currently housed within the Westminster Synagogue. But let's look at some photos of the collection. On the left here, you can see a Torah scroll, which is clearly burnt. Many of the scrolls were burnt in the fires that were set by the Nazis um, in the Shul buildings. Other scrolls came to Westminster with blood stains on them, with bullet holes in them. It was just very moving and very tragic. The center photo here shows you what beautiful script is inside our Torah scrolls. We say that they are Czech scrolls. The vast majority of the scrolls were written in the lands of Bohemia and Moravia. And while I'm not a scribe, I've been told that some of the attributes of the way the letters are shaped helped the scribes know where they were written. If you can read Hebrew, I would point out the letter Shin and the letter Pe in the center of this photo as examples of beautiful, unusual script in our scrolls. The photo on the bottom is very interesting. This is a Torah binder. The Czech Jews post-World War I were quite assimilated. They had moved from Orthodoxy to Reform Judaism, taking on um, that trend from the German lands, which were just bordering to the West. And Czech Jews were trying to grapple with some of the same issues that we grapple with here in America today. What is their identity? Are they Czech Jews? Are they Jewish Czechs? And we can see that here in this binder, which is actually written in Czech. I think it's a perfect example of the way the Czech Jews had assimilated into the culture and into the people and how the Czech non-Jews and the Czech Jews lived quite harmoniously together. <clears throat> the last photo to the right is a photo of one of our Haftarah scrolls. We often think of reading Haftarah from a book, but originally Haftarah were written in scrolls and we have a few of them within our collection. Next slide, please. MST has some ongoing projects. Of course, 
Sheila and Julius's book is our current STAR project. Um, we also have plans to send around the world an exhibition of our binders. I mentioned we have 400 of them. They uh, span several hundred years in age and some are beautiful handicrafts. As you can see in this picture, this is a handmade Torah binder um, for a baby that was born under the sign of Taurus, hence the little animal on top. Um, our collection is quite diverse and when COVID clears, I hope you'll hear more information about that. Next slide, please. We also encourage our scroll holders to have gatherings of the scrolls. And you had one there in Massachusetts many years ago, and it was quite a success. In 2019, we had a very large scroll gathering. We had a reunion of 75 of our scrolls, which attracted 800 people to a very large synagogue in Manhattan. And here's a photo of some of the scrolls laid out on the table and some of the people filing in in the back. Next slide, please. To those entrusted with one of our scrolls, they are a symbol of hope as well as sorrow. Each scroll is a messenger sent from a Jewish community wiped out in the 20th century, but one that doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Let us teach our children about the world of miracles and let us use the scrolls to remind people today of what binds us together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so now I am delighted to turn this over to Sheila and Julius as they are going to present on their book. Um, let me just for a moment say that this is one program and we're having a second program next week, which is going to be featuring uh, a short movie with the scribe who's also on the call right now, Rabbi Kevin Hale called Commandment 613 and his work to restore these scrolls. So you're here at this event, but there is a second, a part two of the event while I have everybody's attention here so that you can, but you have to register for that separately. And I will put that registration uh, information where you can click on a link into the chat in a few moments. So uh, Sheila and Julius, please take it away. I'm going to um, I'm going to share your slides, and you're going to be able to all witness and see some of the extraordinary photography that is a part of this. Can you all see? Yeah. Sheila, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know where you went. So, uh, okay, so you're gonna take it away, okay? Okay, I got it. All right, I'll share my screen again. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sheila, and I'm so happy to be able to share some of the highlights of our book. Well, thank you very much. It's a kind of privilege for me to be able to participate in this webinar. Thank you very much, Rabbi. And hello, everyone, and hello, all the friends that I've met before. As you can see, the title of the book, we, hard, we worked on it hard and we finally arrived to title Life Beyond the Shadows, which was our final feelings and conclusion from the whole journey we took. And the subtitle, we didn't expect that, is also Renewable of Jewish Life in Czechia because our journey evolved quite dramatically from different places. You ended up in a living congregation and we hope to, to show you more in a few slides later. The next one, Rabbi. Next. So this is what our talk will be today. And I'll start by just telling you a little bit about how it all started. Our journey began five years ago um, during the restoration of our Czech Torah from Prestice. 
I became, then became involved with the Memorial Scrolls Trust as a volunteer, and then offered to go to the Czech Republic with my husband, Herb, to photograph the towns the scrolls were from. Frankly, I did not know what to expect, but I had a premonition that it would be an adventure of a lifetime. And I connected with Julius and asked him to be our guide. So, and also as I, as a genealogist, I went to a couple of those places as my clients before. So I knew some of those places and I knew there are no Jews left in those places. So I was just very curious and interested what we will find there. But what I did not find, did what I did not expect that we entered the deep water of the whole world of Czech Torah scrolls and we learned a lot and it's a kind of journey that I will never forget. So we're, um, we're going to highlight four towns and in between you'll hear our thoughts and insights and, and at the end there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask questions. Uh, next slide please. So this is um, the Czech Republic um, and Julius, why don't you take it from here? You were the driver. <laughs> it's a brief picture of the geography but it's not the main message of the slide. All the dots in the in the map shows you the collection points of Torah scrolls and other Judaica taken from Jewish people in those all those places. So it's not only a map of a country, but it's also a map of humiliation decrees, which was meant to humiliate people before they were deported, because in most of the places, most of the people who are not able to escape, they're waiting for deportation finally to the concentration camps in the east. So this is the collection points map actually and we went through all of those places one by one and we will tell you more. Next one please. Most tourists when they go to the Czech Republic spend their time in Prague and perhaps do a few day trips to Terezin or to Kolín which is a town nearby. And what they're missing is the extraordinary beauty of the countryside. There are mountains, lakes, castles, and spectacularly restored synagogues. We met incredible people along the way and experienced never ending coincidences that became spiritual happenings for all of us. Yeah, because when we started the journey, we went to a couple of places. And finally, the beauty of the country and the sanctuary started to show us because after all those destructions, signs of destruction and losses, the beauty showed somehow to comfort us. And gradually, one by one, we were able to see sparks of the light in our journey. And this is just short kind of re re review. There were one third of the synagogues were destroyed by the Nazi during the wartime. Another third of the synagogues were demolished by the, during the communist regime because the synagogues were abandoned and dilapidating, so they were gradually destroyed, also as a symbol of religious thing, which communists didn't like. And then third is still standing. So we were able to visit all of those places and we saw most of those one third of the synagogues. And we also discovered that the Czechs have a very special feeling toward Jewish people. I would say rather friendly because the Czech has a, has a long history of Protestantism. They were, they were oppressed by the Catholic Church for three centuries. So for many people, Jews, even if you go to little places like Trebij, the local Hussites member will tell you, have welcome brothers because they felt strong affiliation with Judaism. Um, the next one, please. So I <clears throat> just want to tell you a little bit about the structure of the book. Um, there are um, chap there are uh, four chapters of the book. First, we will uh, we tell the story of the Memorial Scrolls Trust, and it evolves into the photographs and stories about remembering, then rebuilding, and then rekindling the light. And in between are 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 wonderful essays written by wonderful people. Um, and, um, and and it 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 follows it, it follows kind of our spiritual journey. Um, and Julius, want to add to that? 
Yeah, sure. So the structure is quite well done, actually, because it shows the evolvement of our journey. You can see examples of a simple memorial, so nothing is left in the towns, like on the far right side. You can see Parvatha Memorial with his hands promising, and they'll never forget the victims. Also, we visited places, the synagogues are still standing. You can see some example of the Aron HaKodesh in the little town in southern Bohemia, where they found miraculously safe Torah scroll in the attic. Down there, it was our strongest moments of our journey when we visited living congregations. The next one, please. So I have to say, Kosovahara was one of my very favorite places. Um, when we approached this town, Julius had made contact with the owner of the synagogue and the rabbi's house, and I waited outside and wandered into the old Jewish ghetto um, and took some photographs. As you can see on the right hand side, the square is that's outlined is where the Jewish ghetto was in that town. Um, and now Julius is going to tell you the story of, of um, the owner of the synagogue. So after a couple of days, we arrived also to this place. So I called the man in advance, and he was supposed to live in the rabbi's, a former rabbi's house. So I knocked on the door. He showed up, and he was looked like a simple man. He started to talk the whole story, how he went through this little town in 1978, like a tourist, and he saw dilapidating probably synagogues. He went to the municipality asking who is the owner, what's going to happen. There were already two bulldozers standing next to the building, ready to demolish it completely very next week. So he went to Prague to ask the owner if he can buy the house. So he, he bought the house, 1978, for one month salary. And then step by step, one by one, when he saves some money, he fixed the windows, then he fixed the roof, then he fixed the ceiling. And gradually he got some bigger money in the 1997 or something like that. So he built it up from scratch and he's my hero. You wanna just, next slide, please. There is his, there is Mr. L, the, the hero. And um, the, photograph on the right is the entrance to the rabbi's house and he has built a memorial in front of the house and what was so unbelievable is um, Julius asked him why he did this and his response was because it was the right thing to do it's a sacred place it moved me so much I couldn't believe it and um, the next slide please so Mr. L, his name is, he unlocked the front door of the synagogue and we walked in. It took my breath away. The light was streaming in from the right side. It was incredible, completely unexpected, just completely unexpected. All of us just, Herb, uh, Julius and I just stood there with our mouths gaped and we were gaping because it was so, so unbelievable. Yeah, this is one example when the sparks of light started to show to us, like enlightening our journey. That's a wonderful example of what one man, one human being can do, restoring the place from the very scratch, from the ruins. He went to the archives, studied the old pictures, old plans, and he just make it like his lifetime mission. Uh, the next one, please. Now we've, we are in Olomouc, and Olomouc was very special because Jill Marin accompanied us. We had met her a few months earlier uh, in Prague, and her, her mother's side of the family was from Olomouc, and I asked her to join us. She, had written, she has written a beautiful essay in our book telling her family's story. She showed us where members of her family had lived, and then she showed us where the, and right in front of where they lived, she had Stoperstein installed in the sidewalk in the front of their former home. Yeah, so as you can see, this is the example of very personal commemoration of Shah victims. You can find it, unfortunately, in many, many checked out nowadays. It's for those who are not familiar with the 
concept. They are always the name and the date, like a birth date and the date of the death of a particular person. So you can walk on the sidewalks and concerned with Alamos, there were 1,125 people killed from the Jewish community of Alamos during the Shoah. And she, <clears throat> right across from where her family lived <laughs> was the synagogue. And what I did was, now it's just a parking lot. And what I did was I, superimposed the, an old photograph of the synagogue onto the parking lot. And I was able to, in the background, I was able to match the windows. So this was the approximate location of this, the grand synagogue that, that was there. So the, syn the synagogue was destroyed 1939 by the Germans. The whole building was crashed, put on fire, and quite miraculously, the windows from the synagogue were saved by the firemen in those horrible days. And someone mentioned in the chat, the windows ended up in Loshtice, where Ludwig Stepel, another righteous person in the country, saved the windows and was able to deal with the owner, owner, so to speak, owner. And he put them in a Loshtice synagogue. So you can see it nowadays, the beauty of the windows from Alamos. And also some, some People survived the Holocaust. They moved mostly to Israel. We were supposed to meet them last year in Beit Terezin. We hope to see them later, maybe next year. On the next slide, please. And here is an example of rebirth. Um, we visited the Olomouc Jewish Community Center. It's an active and growing community. And um, there are about 300 members. Uh, the, uh, on the right-hand side is a photograph of uh, two Torahs. The one on the right was one from one of the Czech Torahs that was loaned to the memorials, loaned by the Memorial Scrolls Trust to the Peninsula Sinai Congregation in Foster City in California for 47 years. The Torah was restored and made kosher, and the congregation requested that. MST loan it to Olomoc instead. And in 2017, it was returned to Olomoc. Yes, as, as you said, Sheila, it was one of the greatest moments of our journey. So we ended up in a play which is active Jewish community. The synagogue destroyed 1939, but they were able to build up a new sanctuary in the community house in the downtown of Olomoc. And as you can see, there are Sidurim lying on, on the benches. So what we can say, I'm Israel Chai. The, the next slide, please. And now we're in Prestitza. So excited I was, I can't tell you, I would finally see the town our Torah was from. I touched it, I carried it, I was inspired by it, and then something truly amazing happened. We went as our normal uh, way of, of going from town to town was to stop in an information center in that town. All Czech towns have an information center. There's a great big um, letter I that is on the outside of the, of the uh, building. They told us that there was a meeting in the town hall at 10 o'clock, a block away, and we were late. Julius explained that we're, we were not the visitors they were expecting. And she said, just go, go anyway. So we hustled down the street as fast as we could. And standing outside the door was the mayor and the vice mayor. And Julius told him, them actually, who we were. And they said, no matter, just go inside. So a couple minutes later, the visitors arrived from London and from the Westminster Synagogue, headed by their rabbi, rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi S Solomon. Everyone was surprised and delighted. It was just wonderful. If we had arrived in Prestitza a half an hour later or a half an hour before, well, maybe before, because we would have been told, but after, we would have missed this whole thing. Um, later, we joined them and we walked across the street to their the Prestige Shoah Memorial and Rabbi Solomon led a Yisker service and the, and the names of the Shoah victims were read. 
Next slide. Please. So this is yeah. example, just a few words about the, this is a good example how the memory of the Jewish community is kept by the local municipality, not by individuals, not by the NGOs like in other places. This is, this is also a good example that even in the 1970s, the memorial was erected by the former so-called communist local government. So they kept the memory. And this is a nice example of the town. On the left side, the yellow building is from an older synagogue. Nowadays, it's a textile shop. And old people still recall the, the picture on the right side. It's called Judovska, Jewish Street, even nowadays. People just transfer that memory. And it's a good example of what we expected and expect found in many places during our journey. There's a kind of long-term memory in every particular town, especially for older people or people who care, librarians, archivists, they know the history of the town. They know the Jews were living in there. And if you are, are able to ask the right questions, you will get a lot of striking answers as we experience along our journey. So this is another example. Some people told us the place was famous because the local rabbi before the wall was walking shoulder by shoulder by the Catholic priest discussing whatever matter you can imagine, maybe gossiping, maybe ritual thing, maybe liturgy, whatever. And after half a century, again, the local Protestant priest is in regular contact with Rabbi Solomon from Westminster Synagogue. So they, they also visited each other. They are in close contact, probably just discussing whatever they can discuss. So history is still there, living as an example. Next slide, please. At the end of our journey, we again returned to Prestiza. We were asked to exhibit my photographs of Rabbi Hale by the town museum curator. On opening night, um, we did a, pre a presentation. It had been advertised in local area newspapers. And when we walked in, there were fi about 50 empty seats. And I said to Julius, well, if we have an audience of about two or three or four or five, we'll be really lucky. And so then we went off to the curator's office. And when we returned, all 50 seats were filled, plus standing room. Local people, town officials, including the mayor and the vice mayor, who are sitting there in the front. People from surrounding areas had driven there to attend the presentation. And it was, I would say, probably 90% non-Jewish people, just people who were interested in learning. And I felt like I had gone full circle from Sharon to Prestita, to, to back to Sharon. And it was truly an incredibly spiritual journey for me. And, and after I the meeting, we were surrounded by local people asking questions. One of those men approached us saying, my father was in a camp because he was Jewish. So it's kind of hidden reality is still there like a burning ember. And it's also a wonderful example that for some Czech people, for many of them, somehow, even shockingly, the Jewish history for them is a part of the Czech national heritage, whatever you can you know, consider that or think about it. Next slide, yeah. Julius is gonna pronounce this because I can- That's cannot. right, it's a quite hard, it's a trash, it's a place in the border between Moravia and Bohemia. And this is a nice example of relationship between the different churches. Soon after the war, the, the former synagogue was bought after the destruction of the Jewish community in Trish. Synagogue was bought by the Hussites church, like in many other places, Humpolets, Prostiov, Lipnik, Kladno, many, many other places were bought by the Hussite church. And this particular town, the Hussite church people decided they will keep the first floor as a memorial of the former synagogue of the Jewish people. So they inhabited the second floor as their sanctuary. Next slide. With respect to the Jewish people who lived there in the youth, the synagogue. So and that's I, oh. that's how the first floor looked like today. Instead of bima, there's a remnants of bima with those little stones. This you can see on the right uh, on the right side. You can see the stones with the names, and it's the work of the local school children who worked on the history of the Jewish people in in Chesht. and they made this kind of typical or untypical memorial of the Jewish victims of Holocaust in their hometown. And, um, the yeah, next go slide. Ahead, sure. and this is another example, very personal. One of those many levels of 
commemoration of Shah victims and the history of the country. It's a wonderful example of another project, which is a large scale project, very successful in terms of how to teach the local kids. I think it's nice prevention of anti-Semitism. If the kids can learn about the Jewish past of the town, it was cleverly done, invented by the woman from Jewish Museum of Prague. She wanted her own children and other children as well, of course, to be taught about the Shoah in a personal way, in a very active way. So the major task was they asked the school kids go back home and ask the grandparents whether they recalled the Jewish classmates and Jewish friends before the war. And many things surfaced quite acceptably, like in many cases, because it's a rich topic. And so they found out some of those kids had a Jewish ancestry or their grandparents named their daughters by the names of the murdered classmates. So a lot of those kids learned that their own mother was named after someone who was killed in the Holocaust. Each panel represents one family. And you can see the, the student present the project to the local public. They invite also survivors and descendants of survivors. They show them they care about the Jewish history of the town. Next slide. So on an ongoing basis, there are things happening in the Czech Republic. Um, Julius mentioned the Missing Neighbors pro Project. And on the top um, left of this slide, um, the, you can see some teenagers standing in a cemetery. We happened upon them once again, if we had arrived there a half an hour later or a half an hour before, we would never have met this group of kids. Their teacher had created this project because she wanted them to understand um, what they were about, what their, their legacy, their, what was in their DNA. And she felt that learning about the Jewish legacy in their town was very important. And, um, and that's what they were doing. They were going, they went into the cemetery and collected names and then they were uh, researching um, the people that of the names that they had collected. Also, we happened on a Yom HaShoah. Uh, uh, we actually didn't happen on it. We planned it, but it was um, Yom HaShoah day and we attended um, a, a wonderful service. And, um, and uh, at that service, all of the names of those who died in the Shoah were, were read. Uh, the, I have a small photograph here in, of um, Mikolov, which is an absolutely beautiful town in, uh, in, Mor in Moravia. And it is one of the many of the of 10 restorations that were funded by um, uh, the Federation of Jewish Communities and the EU and, and other uh, uneve other funding organisms to um, restore 10 uh, synagogues and other Judea, Judaic buildings in the, in, the, in the towns. And they, they're all of them just extraordinarily well done, really extraordinary. And Julius told you about the Stoberstein, that is a project that is ongoing. Um, also, Another ongoing project is the Jewish Museum of Prague has supplied schools around the country with, um, uh, with bulbs to grow crocuses. Um, and that's uh, uh, um, in memory of all the children who perished during the Shoah. Um, next, please. As you mentioned, 10 Stars Project, which was funded by EU with a coordination of Jewish Federation of Czech, Czech, Czech Republic, you can see another example of one. I would say the, uh, it's not a nice example. One lady from Prague, Anne Miriam, moved to Polna, another place of 10 stars project, to live there, to bring the Yiddish guy back to the town. There were no Jews left. And it's, I would say, in our post Holocaust country, it's usually one man or one woman mission to revive and start new projects, start awareness again, which is still there, but must be somehow revived. And she's organizing her own Stolperstein project. So she invented her own way how to do it. She's organizing laying Stolperstein twice a year. You can see example of a grandson of Shoah survivor 
is, was laying Stolpersteiner for his distant relatives in the town. And this is another example. One, one person can do a lot. Next, please. So what began as a journey to capture what was left of Judaically in the Czech lands after the Shoah became so much more. It became a story of resilience and compassion, faith and hope, far more than I ever expected. And for me, it was life changing. Yeah, I would say I was very grateful that I was taking part of the project. This, the book is kind of a window into our journey. And we also visited places like this. So what better can be, what more hopeful can be if we visited a place where the Torah scrolls have homes in Czech Republic, people celebrating Simcha Torah. So that was our kind of greatest experience from our journey. We are very grateful that we could be part of it, whoever arranged that for us. Thank you for your attention. I just want to um, thank uh, Rabbi Mesler for his support and the members of the book de uh, debut committee for their love and support. Melody Ritt, Allison Schnipper and Sherry Kamelwitz. And there are many people on this webinar today who have helped and supported our journey. You know who you are. And <laughs> Julius and I, thank you very, very, very much. And, and now we'll take some questions. So we're going to take questions purely through the chat function. So if you have a question and want to share uh, something, please do so. Um, and uh, Jill helped me out by uh, scanning through some of those as well. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I want to, what I'm going to do in the chat is just uh, put, share again that if you want to join us next week, for the 20 minute movie and then panel discussion, including Rabbi Kevin Hale, who is the sofa, who's the scribe who works on these scrolls, please, you have to register in advance as always, but uh, there is the link and you can join us. It's the same time we pick 1 p.m. in the uh, Sunday afternoon to be able to um, capture all these time zones <laughs> from West Coast to Europe to Israel. So that's why we're on Sunday, East Coast time for those of us who are local, why we're Sunday 1 p.m. And yes, I know it's Sunday on February 7th, the first Sunday, uh, but remember the Super Bowl doesn't start until that evening. So you have plenty of time to join us and, uh, and also see that game there. So uh, Jill, any questions? She's muted. Um, there's a question, are all of the 10 star synagogues included in your book? Um, I would say about eight of the 10, not all 10. And there's a reason. Um, some of the 10 star synagogues were, uh, are, my initial focus was to just visit all of the a memorial scrolls trust collection points. And at the time that all of those, the scrolls were collected, the area on the perimeter of the Czech Republic had been captured by the Germans. It's, it was the Sudetenland and all, it's called the Sudetenland and all many of those synagogues had been destroyed. Uh, and all of the Jews were required to leave the Sudetenland. So there was a time, a a time issue between um, the time that they became, that they were, uh, that they became part of Germany and the time that the collection points were um, designated. So, and some of the restorations actually took place in the Sudetenland. So we didn't get there, but that doesn't mean that I won't add them at some point. This book is the beginning of my journey and there will be another book 
I yeah, if you go to the index page of location, we visited nine of 10. The 10th one is in Krnovich or Sudetenland at the time. So we visited nine of them. You can see Březnice, Boskovice, other places are listed in, in the index of location. Nine of 10 we visited. And also there's a question, if I, if I may, you know, someone asked how is to be a Jew in the Czech Republic? Sheila, would you, would you say how you feel that the Jews are living in the country and how people feel about them? You, you said it nicely. I don't want to you know, make it. <laughs> I think it's extraordinary, actually. Um, people have um, this warm feeling about Jews in the country. It's, un, it's you know, all the surrounding, I, I can't say that there's no anti-Semitism. There is some, and Jill, who is on, uh, will attest to that. There's anti-Semitism in the Czech Republic. But compared to what's happening in all of the surrounding countries, it's, it's minimal. It's minimal. Uh, there are incidents, but they are, in, in, uh, they are, they are not compared to the U.S. They're, they're, or uh, other places in Europe, it's, it's minimal. Um, and as the Jewish community, I have found to be so welcoming and so incredibly wonderful that, um, you know, Herb and I consider the Czech Republic our second home. We feel really comfortable there. Um, and um, so the answer I would say is yes, but. Yeah, and if I say a few words, it's, it's a still you can, it's palpable. It's a post Holocaust country like any other country in Europe. And this is, this is hardly touched. So there are a lot of intermarriages, but we still have a five denominations. So you can pick up your own choice. And if you're interested to learn more, I think the Etz Chaim, the Reform Congregation will organize similar panel or webinar in, in mid of February. So right. if you let your email somewhere, I would say that Rabbi Max will be happy to, to send you a link. You, you can join an English weekend webinar held in Prague by Rabbi Max of Etz Chaim. So you can ask the question. I have, uh, I want to bring up a couple of questions, which is said, first of all, how, Julius, had you been to all of these places before and how on earth did you um, get to 132 towns? These two folks, and Herb, Herb, you get credit, Herb. Uh, <laughs> you went to 132 towns to document and photograph these places. What a, you know, what an incredible trip and how did you put that together and the follow-up question was, if you were to go back, is there anything um, you missed? So I would now, start- behind, with, behind every good a photographer, there's a Herb. So there you go, how's that? Right. Great thanks to Herb sitting in the back seat, helping us, you know, correcting notes, reminding us of things we missed, a lot of things. Without Herb, it would be a different story. But basically I went to about maybe half of the places within the last 20 years. And I just went there for a little moment, see the house of a particular Jewish family, and then, then I left again. And I went once with my client, he asked, he said, he had a kind of, kind of thought, and he said, well, if I stay here, I, I will be living in the same house, what I will be doing. And then he said, and I just didn't want to interrupt him, so I just said, I let him think more. And he said, well, wait a minute. If I stay here, I will be dead because they would kill me. So it's, it's, it was kind of entrance to all those places. Some people say the Czech towns are ghost towns, which I felt somehow, you know, offended. But in the terms of Jewish presence, there are hardly any Jews left, but the memory is still there. And I said before, the memory is still there. You can ask several questions, you will get the answer. So the presence is still there, somehow inherited. It will, it will not disappear. It will be still there. A certain, you know, Forgetness, but it's it's still there. So, I, but I was thrilled to see. I saw the places from one 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 point of view. Now I got a much bigger picture. A whole whole picture showed up to me. Different initiatives, different approaches, totally different than I what I expected before. And and Sheila, I, I just want to add that our day started out oh, eight thirty or nine o'clock in the morning, and we frequently didn't get back until seven or eight o'clock at night. And um, 
and we would do that three times a week. So you can just imagine our agenda. Um, and in those, and Lois is shaking her hand because Lois, Lois participated. She came to visit us in, in Prague and she went out on our journey with us for a couple of days. She, I, you know, I won't speak for her, but it was, it was busy. <laughs> it was busy. And when I, and when I got back, I would have, you know, lots of photographs to go through. And I edited all the photographs that I would take over that week and upload them to um, London. So Herb and I would not call this a vacation, but it was the most exciting adventure that he and I, I think have had. It was just incredibly wonderful. Two, two related questions. One is, and this is maybe for Lois, um, does the Memorial Scroll Trust have a virtual tour available? And the other is, were there efforts to restore Torah scrolls from any other Eastern European countries after the Holocaust, similar to this project with the Czech Torah scrolls? That's a good Okay. Um, first of all, we are currently closed in the museum in London, but if anyone is interested in having some Zoom content for their synagogue or a school or university or a museum, if you write to Roman, R-O-M-A-N, at Memorial Scrolls Trust, Dot org. Um, I will get back to you. We do have a couple of uh, Zoom lectures that have been um, very popular since the pandemic began. And we are working on a virtual tour of the museum itself. Um, so you can contact me directly for that. That's and Roman at memorialscrollstrust.com. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Thank you. Are you under the moment that Sheila took? 3,000 pictures, and there are only a couple of hundreds in the book. So there are thousands of pictures for each time almost. So we can ask Sheila, and with the help of Lois, you can have many pictures from other places. Um, also, I want to offer, um, we'll be happy to do a, a presentation to, to your synagogue about our book. And, you know, we're, we're available for a, a webinar anywhere because we want to share this information with the world. Uh, Sheila, is there, um, would you want to give out your email address or do you want uh, those uh, to go to the Memorial Scrolls Trust for those presentations? How would you like to handle that? I'll be happy to give you my mine. It's spalay at comcast.net. Can you type it down, Sheila, somehow? I just did. It's in the chat. Um, we're going to need to wrap up, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us for this program. And a big thank you to Julius and Sheila and Lois uh, and everybody at the Memorial Scrolls Trust and all of those hosts that brought you around and helped you on this journey. I want to hold up the book again. Uh, I know that if you contact the Memorial Scrolls Trust, uh, that copies are available for sale. So that's the best way to do it. Uh, you can go to the Memorial Scrolls Trust and do that. Uh, Temple Sinai, we have some limited copies uh, within our congregation and you know how to reach those. Just check your weekly email. Uh, and a big thank you to Sheila for, that, for those copies. So everyone, um, a big thank you. And join us next week. Register, please, and join us next week. And thank you for joining us, everybody. I uh, want to also just say, uh, this past week, we commemorated International Holocaust Memorial Day. And what a, um, what a way to commemorate that by having you all join us here today and to remember that life. And what's a response? What is a response to that kind of trauma and disaster? Well, it's to restore a Torah scroll, and then to have people reading from it and to double down on our life uh, and, and who we are and to celebrate our Jewish tradition and identity. So thank you everyone and be well and be safe. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye.